Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to sing your praises. You have given us words. You've given us life. And we have these things by your power, by your spirit, and by your word. God, these things last forever. They transcend our circumstance. They transcend the disillusion of this universe. And we have them in you. You have given us such a sure and solid foundation. I pray that you would keep us, that we would never be moved, grow our confidence in your word, even this morning, for your glory in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're continuing our series in a philosophy of ministry. And by way of reminder, a philosophy of ministry is something like the DNA of an organism. It's invisible to the outside, perhaps, but they are the convictional commitments which are underneath everything that we do as a church. They shape and form the various ministries and programs and commitments of the church. And We've talked about preach the word, shepherd the flock, equip the saints, grow the church, make disciples, follow the script, identify error, preach the gospel, embrace the foolishness. We come now this morning to accurately handle the word, accurately handle the word. And just so that you get the roadmap of where we're headed, there are four more of these to make a total of 15. We'll cover prioritizing people, developing leaders, disciplining the wayward, and loving the Savior. Uh, that is what lies ahead of us. And Lord willing, we'll finish that up October 7th and be back into regular exposition verse by verse through Scripture. Let's begin our time this morning by reading 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Here's God's instructions through the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. This is a passage that shapes every ministry of this church. It is a passage that encourages all of us to work hard to correctly understand the Bible. This is the classic passage on hermeneutics, and if you're not familiar with that term, now we will be by the end of our time this morning. I'm going to give just a couple of short definitions at the front end for some words I'll be using frequently, and the first one is hermeneutics, and by hermeneutics, we simply mean rules for interpretation, rules for interpretation. Perhaps you've heard the word exegesis or exegetical methodology or some other variation of that word. It simply means to get the meaning out of or from a text. To exegete is to extract the meaning from a text. That is the practice of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics are the rules for interpretation. Exegesis is using those rules to understand the meaning of a text in our Bible. Eisegesis is the opposite of exegesis. Instead of getting the meaning out of the text, eisegesis is putting our meaning into the text. Eisegesis is a no-no. We don't do that one. There is narcegesis. That is the belief that every text is always and only about me. We don't do that one either. And then, of course, there is help me, Jesus, which is appropriate, <laughs> which is what you should say when you open your Bible. It's a good expression of dependence upon the author of this book. What I want to do this morning is look at six essential descriptions of a teacher of God's Word from 2 Timothy 2.15. One who handles God's Word must be these following six things we're going to look at this morning. And before you tune out... Before you think that this only applies to pastors and seminary students, I want to help us see the need for all of us to pursue these six features of character, these six descriptions 
of what a teacher of God's word must be. The first reference, of course, in 2 Timothy 2.15 is to Timothy. Paul is writing this, his second letter to Timothy. It is Paul the apostle writing to Timothy, a pastor at Ephesus. He was a pastor who was training pastors. We'll develop this in a couple of weeks where Paul tells Timothy, entrust these things to faithful men. Timothy, as well as Titus, were to set things in order by establishing qualified leaders in churches. So Timothy was a pastor training pastors. That, of course, is Paul's first reference here in 2 Timothy 2.15. He's telling Timothy, Timothy, you be diligent. Handle the word of God accurately. But this need for us to understand God's word goes beyond the need of the pastor, the need of the pastor training pastors. In fact, in order to be saved requires understanding God's word. Romans 10 is clear. If if we don't hear the word of God, if we don't hear the word about Christ, we cannot be saved. And how will they hear unless someone tells? It, It is required that you hear and understand what God is saying to you in order for you to be a Christian at all. And then if you were to go about sharing the gospel with others, you you need to accurately handle the truths of God's word. What good is it for us to obscure and muddy up this most precious message if others are to be saved? And if you think about your parenting, how would you know if your parenting is biblical without an understanding of the Bible? You see, you are handling God's word in your home week in and week out to handle it inaccurately is actually detrimental to your parenting, your everyday living out the Christian life and whatever roles that you have. Understanding the word accurately is critical to your obedience. How do I know what it is that pleases Christ and what does not? How do I know what I'm supposed to do in my fight with sin unless I have God's thoughts if I understand them accurately? By the way, the obedience to God's commands in the Scripture for all Christians require them to be understandable, that's on God's side of things, and they require them to be understood, that's on our end of things. And did you know that God holds you accountable to your obedience to God's commands? Which means that from God's end of things, they are understandable, And on our end of things, we must labor to understand them. You and I must know how to handle God's word so that we may have discernment, to not be blown around by every wind of doctrine, to put out the fiery darts of Satan by faith in what God has said, to face down temptation with transcendent truth, and to know the difference between truth and error. We must understand God's word in order to know God, to know Him. The Word of God is, in fact, His self-disclosure. It's not primarily a a how-to manual. It certainly is not a choose-your-own-adventure novel. Rather, we hang on every word in God's Word so that we may know Him. We desire to know what He meant by what He said because it's Him speaking. Where do you go for these things? To have wisdom for life, to have discernment between truth and error, to to know God. Are you primarily dependent on others for your knowledge of God, or are you seeking Him in His Word? Listen, it's hard to think of any sort of Christian who should not be concerned with hermeneutics. Whether you are regularly, actively teaching God's Word to others, or you are teaching your own heart, you must be, number one, earnest. You must be earnest. Look at what Paul says to Timothy. Be diligent, New American Standard. Or if you're reading the ESV, do your best. That is, Paul enjoins Timothy to be conscientious about handling God's word, to be zealous, to be eager, The idea of this word is to spare no effort. This word is a word that Paul uses in other places. Uh, He says, do your best to come to me before winter. 
He wants Timothy to use every effort at his disposal to meet this need. Here, the need is handle the word of God accurately. Do your best. Be earnest. Be conscientious about it. Spare no effort. Here's a second characteristic that must describe those handling the word of God. You must be accountable, or better said, you are accountable. Paul tells Timothy, be diligent to present yourself to God. Be diligent to present yourself to God. That is, what Timothy does with the Word of God is actually before him. And there is a day when Timothy will stand, or has stood already, before God, accountable for the way he has handled God's Word. And when you're reading your Bible, it's probably helpful to ask yourself this question. If the author of this book were looking over my shoulder as I read it, how do I think he would want me to read it? We should be asking ourselves that question. In other words, we should not feel the freedom to do whatever we want with God's words. These are God's words. How does God want me to read God's words? Is God biased? Yes, and we want his bias. <laughs> we want his frame of mind. We want to know what he means by what he says. And there's accountability for these things. We're not free to just take God's words, apply them and employ them in any way we see fit, and still believe that we have God's words. You see, if you divest the Bible of God's meaning, you no longer have the Bible. No matter how similar the words you might be using are. Now, one pastor has said it this way, without the meaning of the scriptures, you do not have the scriptures. These are God's words. In a recent sermon on this text, John Anderson said, hermeneutics gets really easy when you think about standing before God. The issues are really actually simple when you project forward and you think, I'm reading my Bible and God wrote it and I'm going to stand before him accountable to how I handled this. I better get it right. The fact is, God is actually looking over my shoulder as I read his word. And he will hold us accountable for how we have handled his word. This is why James 3.1 says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren. Why? Because you will incur a stricter judgment. Did you hear that? Stricter. There is an accountability for all of us in how we handle God's word. All of us are accountable. Teachers of God's word are accountabler. One author on hermeneutics said this, Scripture has much to say about the reader. God condemns any twisting or perversion of his word. He holds the reader to rightly dividing the scripture. Readers do not have hermeneutical freedom, but hermeneutical accountability. The handler of God's word must be earnest and accountable. And thirdly, proven. Proven. Notice what Paul says. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Approved to God. This word for being approved is really best understood by two English words. Tested and proven. Or tried and true. Tested in order to be found genuine. This was a word that came out of the world of metallurgy. You would take a precious metal and you would heat it up until it liquefied and impurities would rise to the surface and those impurities were scraped off. The testing by fire actually was a means by which the purification of that metal took place. It was also used in the world of military training. The Roman soldier was said to be approved in this manner when he was trained, and with that training came a testing that brought refinement so that the soldier was actually made in the process. You might think of Navy SEAL training or Army Ranger training. The type of training that develops the man as it is examining him, and the testing by fire produces the genuine article. The idea here is that Timothy is to be tried and true in his handling the word of God. 
he is to be proven, to stand before God and have the stamp approved, placed over your life's work. That's what Timothy was to aim at. Fourthly, Timothy was to be industrious, industrious. Again, look at verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman. Do you see that? A workman. A worker. Listen, the practice of hermeneutics, the applying the rules of hermeneutics to a biblical text and doing exegesis is, is labor. It's labor. And, and it's not easy it begins with reading, reading your Bible, just simply reading your Bible again and again and again. In the macro and the micro, read big swaths of Scripture and slow down and, and read the details. When it comes to your Bible reading, I, I think you want the forest and the trees, you want to see the, the whole panorama of a, of a five-acre plot of forest from way up in the air and see what the whole thing looks like and how it's laid out. You want to know where all these various portions of that five-acre plot fit into the whole. And then you want to zoom in. And you want to see that one glade of trees. And then you want to narrow in on that one tree and, and that one major branch on the tree and that one piece of bark flaking off on that major branch and maybe the bark beetle and maybe the veins in the wings of the bark beetle on that one tree in that one glade in that forest. And the reality is you and I will never exhaust the richness of Scripture in our lifetimes. The joy of discovery of who he is and what he is like and how he thinks and what he is doing are rich and deep like no other book. And so you read and you read and you read. And by reading your Bible, you will come to approximate the thinking of God. <laughs> You're bringing your thoughts closer and closer and closer to his. There's no big mystery in how the Bible works. There's really no need for some secret decoder ring that fleshes out the secrets that are otherwise unavailable to you. No, you just read your Bible. And God's meaning becomes plainer and plainer. It doesn't mean that it's shallow, <laughs> Uh, no, actually, the, the depth and majesty of the Word of God become clearer and clearer as you expose your heart to more and more of it over a lifetime. We read our Bibles. Not only do we read our Bibles, but we start looking in the details at words. We want to know what words mean. Sentences are made of words, paragraphs made of sentences, chapters in our Bible and books of the Bible and the two testaments of the Bible and the Bible as a whole are made up of these little bits and pieces called words. You know what they are, you've used them. And we have to be careful with words and their meanings. Right? This is where some of the labor comes in. You know, you might be reading Romans 1.16 and you discover that the gospel is the what? Power of God for salvation. And you discover that the Greek word for power is dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. And you and your best 70s sitcom voice say the gospel is what? Dynamite. <laughs> and then you realize, oh, dynamite wasn't invented until the 1860s by Alfred Nobel. And so Paul couldn't have meant that the gospel is explosive, destroying everybody around it in near proximity. Like the lady you read about this week that went to her basement for candles and a powder outage and she lit a stick of dynamite. Did you read about that? That's not a good description of the gospel. And we might think that, ooh, that's a really cool word with a really cool meaning and the Bible gets really cool when I have my really cool meanings of really cool words. But did we understand what God meant by what God said? And so we have to be careful with words. The Bible is not some special book where you get to do special things with words according to your own whimsy. 
Now, the Bible is God's self-disclosure, and he used words in order to communicate, not to obfuscate, which is a really obfuscatory word that means you're confusing, <laughs> hiding what you mean to say. God intended to be clear, and he used words. We need to understand what God meant by the words that he used. And words are funny. You could think of the word bored in English, B-O-A-R-D, not I'm bored of this sermon, but the other bored. And if you gave a sentence to me like, he is on the board, you could mean any number of things, a construction worker standing on a plank, a company executive serving on a board of directors, an Olympic diver about to spring into a pool, right? Room and board means the food at a bed and breakfast. To get on board means to embark on a ship or metaphorically to join a cause, and all of these uses of the English word board have something to do with a plank of wood. Right? The room and board actually used to refer to the, the table made out of boards on which the food was served. So you're getting room, a place to sleep, and board the food at breakfast. Or a board of directors really talks about the table, again, made out of boards that the directors sit around. Or the diving board, they weren't always made out of fiberglass or whatever they're made out of. And to board a ship, to get on board the ship, literally meant in the old days to get on the boards which made the deck of the ship. So they're all related, but I can't take my favorite definition of board and plug it into the sentence and expect to get the meaning of the author. I actually have to know how the words relate to each other. And so there's a labor in studying my Bible in grammar. And, and those of you who are wincing already, I, it's critical. Did you know that you are a grammarian, even if you don't like the word grammar? You use words together all the time, and you're able to convey meaning, and you're able to understand meaning, and you don't have to know what an adverb is in order to use one. That's good news. All of this means we need to see how the words work together. And so part of the labor in handling God's word accurately is understanding context, and context in a small scale and context in a grand scale. One of my favorite verses is Philippians 2, 3a. You know it. Do nothing. Of course, it has a context. <laughs> Do nothing from what? Selfish ambition. Philippians 4, 6 is another one, 4, 6a, be anxious. What's the context? Be anxious for nothing. Do you see, if you take the words out of the context, you don't actually have the meaning of the author anymore. And, and listen, we, we do this in our Bible sometimes. We, we, we like this verse, we like this phrase, we like this little thing, and, and we pull it out of where it belongs, where the author put it, and we do with it kind of what we want, and we think, look, I have all the authority, all the promise, all the glory of God's word, but, but perhaps we don't. And, and it's a laughable example when we turn do nothing from selfish ambition into do nothing. Clearly, I'm 180 degrees out of God's meaning. But we do this in plenty of other ways, and you can think of your own examples. I, I'll remember the first time I sang the hymn, number 43 in the hymnal, Great is Thy Faithfulness, after discovering from whence in my Bible it came. Do you know it? Lamentations 3, 22 to 23, Here's, here's the verse, the Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Hymn number 43. But this is Lamentations 3. This is Jeremiah sitting on a hill across from Jerusalem in eyesight of the city that is being besieged, surrounded, starving. And, and they are in such dire straits for hunger that, that women are eating their own children. And it's actually a fulfillment of a promise God made back in Deuteronomy that this is exactly what would happen if God's people were unfaithful to him. And so when Jeremiah is crying out, great is thy faithfulness, he's saying, God, you... You kept your promise. 
And Jeremiah is weeping. That's why the book's called Lamentations over the state of the nation and casting hope in God's future restoration. It changes the way you sing the song. Jeremiah 29, 11 is another uh, popular example of it's cross-stitched uh, on your living room wall. Um, keep it there. Keep it there. But just set it in its context. Jeremiah says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Uh, that verse is not primarily about your immediate circumstances. It, Ultimately, we can get there, but, but think about the context. Uh, Israel is in Babylonian captivity. And the promise comes from God to Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you, Israel, declares the Lord. And God is promising them that, listen, things are going to go well for you in Babylon. I've got you there for a time. It's part of my judgment, but I'm not done with you. And I'm going to bring you back to the land at the end of 70 years. And you can't extract Jeremiah 29, 11 out of Jeremiah 29 or out of Jeremiah or out of the context of God's promise with Israel and still think you have God's meaning, right? If I've applied it to my hopes for a new job um, and, and, and have not had in mind what God intended by what he said, then, then I don't have God's word. This is not a blank check promise for me to get the job that I want. But listen carefully, it does give me in the 21st century confidence in the kind of God to whom I have entrusted my life, that he is the kind of God who keeps his promises, that he's the kind of God who loves his people and actually plans for their benefit. And there are plenty of places in scripture that I can go to to count on specific promises of God, just like what he promised to Israel, because he doesn't change. So... If you don't have Jeremiah 29, 11 cross-stitch on your wall, go home, cross-stitch it, and put it on your wall and explain the context. And there's a labor involved for us in getting to the historical setting. We've talked about the words. We've talked about the words next to each other, the context. But it's also helpful to think about the historical setting in which a passage of our Bible shows up. And to do that, we're crossing at least 2,000 years of world history, language, culture, geopolitics, customs, food, clothing, monetary devices, measurements. And, and it takes some work sometimes in order to understand a, a passage. I don't know what a denarius is. I'm going to have to go look that up. And so we have to cross over the 2,000 to 4,000 year gap of history and setting to get to understand how would the original audience have heard this passage? What would they have understood? What was God asking them to think, believe, or do, repent of, turn from, trust in? And listen, the better we do that, the better we're going to be able to think about how this relates to us. And we want to do that, right? We talked about narcissus being the, the wrong kind of Bible study. This is all about me all the time. Well, if you go to understand what God meant by what he said and what he meant by what he said means today what it meant to the original audience, I'm going to work hard to understand what God meant when he said it, to whom he said it. There is tremendous fruit for us, because the same God wrote it. And when we shortcut that process, because we want to apply it to our lives, I, I want to know God, and so this has to mean something for me. If we shortcut the process of understanding the words in their context, in the historical setting, then we're actually going to miss God's meaning. And that undercuts the real benefit for our lives. So this requires some discipline, some work. And it means that a passage of Scripture will only ever mean what the passage originally meant. A text of Scripture will never mean something that it did not mean when it was written. The Bible doesn't change. God meant what he said. 
And so that requires the discipline for us of staying in a passage, being a detective, pouring over its words in their context, seeking the intent of the God who wrote it. And this is hard work, and it's delightful. It's like getting a letter from your beloved. You don't just skim it in the morning because you have to put in your 15 minutes. You don't necessarily read it all out of order and take one word from over here and put it over there and try to put them together and come up with your own meaning. No, this is your beloved, and you want to know what your beloved said. You want to know what your beloved meant by what your beloved said because you love your beloved. If you're a student of hermeneutics, you're looking for authorial intent. What did the author intend? What was the author's intended meaning? And so Paul tells Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman. As a workman. There's work involved. And here's a fifth characteristic we're looking for, unashamed. A workman unashamed. That is like a skilled laborer who is actually eager to have his work inspected because he's given his best. He, he's utilized all of his resources and all of his tools and his best efforts. It's like the engineer who has done the work and the reworking of his calculations on the design of his bridge. He has overseen the construction to his exact specifications and he is eager for the scrutiny. He has, with joy and with skill, created something both useful and beautiful. And he hasn't left reason to be ashamed of his work. He even knows that lives may depend on the quality of his work. And he's put in the work. He's a workman unashamed. How, how tragic would it be to devote your life to something only at the end to realize that you put in shoddy work and it hurt others? You understand, Christian, that your study of God's word impacts you and therefore impacts those in proximity to you. You have a responsibility before the Lord to understand his word rightly, to work hard at it, to labor for it as a workman unashamed. And the sixth and final feature of a man or a woman, a boy or a girl handling God's word is to be accurate. It must be accurate. The word here for accurately handling the word of truth is a phrase that meant something like cutting it straight. It only shows up here in the New Testament one time. It shows up in a Greek translation of the Old Testament two times. And, and there, both times in Proverbs, it's used with the, the word for road or way. And it meant something like to cut a straight path through the wilderness for a road. To, to cut a straight path. It, it was used in other industries uh, in, in the Greek world for cutting something straight, for setting something straight, for getting something right. Probably as a result of this text, the word gets used after the New Testament, to describe getting uh, your doctrine orthodox, getting your doctrine right, getting, getting your uh, understanding of God's truth correct. And here in this passage, it, it simply means to expound correctly, to teach the word aright. And the implication of that command, by the way, this is a command from Paul to Timothy to get it right to cut it straight. The implication is there's a way to do it wrong. You understand that there are wrong interpretations. If there's a right way to understand what God meant by what he said, then, then there's a wrong way. In fact, there are thousands of wrong ways to in, uh, understand anything that God said. Now, this is significant. We live in a, a pluralistic, postmodern culture that believes everything's right and it's on the same level. And that has been pervasive in Christian culture, that all interpretations are sort of on, a, on an equal level. 
It's not the way God views it. God actually gives us a command to cut it straight, to get it right, to accurately handle the word of truth. Would it be saying too much to suggest that not getting it right might be displeasing to him? We've got to get it right. What if we get it wrong? What, what are the consequences of, of getting God's word wrong? Of misunderstanding him, worse, misrepresenting him, leading people astray, leading people away from that which is life and truth, and leading them to other things, the opinions of men, traditions, whatever. It is possible to cut it wrong, to cut it crooked, to interpret incorrectly. And this paragraph that this verse is set in, verses 14 through 19, is a sort of a bad hermeneutics sandwich surrounding verse 15. Now, read this with me. Verse 14, Paul writes to Timothy, remind them of these things, the truths he has gone on before. And solemnly charge them. That is a severe, sober, urgent word. Solemnly charge them in the presence of God. Here again, Paul is invoking God's very presence in this accountability. Not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. And he's talking about a group of men in the church who are treating doctrine like it's a plaything throwing about word games, debating back and forth as if the truth of God's word were something to put on the same level as error, and let's just see which one works out in the end, subject to the skills of the person who's most skilled at debating or something like that. Paul is not telling Timothy, don't be concerned about words. He actually tells him the opposite, <laughs> get it right. But you don't put God's truth on the level with error and have some sort of public forum about it, some sort of wrangling about these things. What is the result of that, verse 14? It's useless and actually leads to the ruin of the hearers. Here's the truth. If you put God's truth on the level with error and let them just air it out and duke it out, you squander, you squander the responsibility with God's people to uphold his truth. When you put it on an equal playing field with error, uh, you give airtime to that which is opposed to God's truth. This is not the way God intends for his truth to be heard. Rather, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. In other words, you should be ashamed if you're doing verse 14 or verses 16, 17, or 18. And how do I go about not being ashamed as an approved workman? Accurately handling the word of truth. Verse 16 goes on, but avoid worldly and empty chatter. It will lead to further ungodliness. Their talk spreads like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place and they upset the faith of some. Do you see the consequences here? These guys in the church preaching untruths, and it has an effect on God's people, God's sheep. An encouragement comes in verse 19, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having the seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. He's putting there the connection between God knows who his real people are. No matter what happens in all the theological confusion that's out there, God keeps track of his people and God's real people pursue right living, holiness, abstaining from wickedness. Now, the quotes in verse 19 both come from Numbers 16 and Korah's Rebellion. Think about a lot of people being swallowed up because they rejected God's truth and followed lies. And these two realities, God knows those who are his, that's a comfort. In a sea of theological confusion, sometimes you can feel like you're alone, but God knows who's, those who are his. And those who are his are actually born out in the way that they live. 
No, this is not the time or place to teach hermeneutics. This morning, my task is simply to press the importance of hermeneutics before us. To give you a window into the importance of hermeneutics in everything that goes on at Grace Bible Church. Of course, in the pulpit, Scott had line diagrammed the entire book of Romans in Greek before he preached the first verse. Why? Because he wants to cut it straight. Are we to have accuracy in the pulpit and a hermeneutical free-for-all in every other ministry? No. <laughs> There's a reason that in student ministries, what do our students hear week after week after week? God's word explained verse by verse. What do the words mean? What do they mean in context? What was the original situation? <laughs> Biblical hermeneutics. An exegetical process producing faithful preaching. But this is true in next generation ministries. Our faithful next generation ministries work hard, tirelessly, week in, week out to make sure our kids are understanding God's truth. Listen, that's not child care over there. That is serious, life changing ministry for which we need more servants. Will you sign up today? You're, there's no, I'm sorry, Tom, I ruined the sign. No one's going to sign up after this sermon. You mean I have to cut the word straight, and if I don't, I answer to God? I'm not signing up for NGM. You'll have help. Not every position needed in NGM is a teaching position either. We need people to be helpers and bodies in the classrooms. Um, and, and really, we are in need of servants in that ministry. The elders would make appeal to you. If, if you haven't found a place to serve, um, really consider Next Generation Ministries as a place to be involved, to use the things that God has invested in your own life to be a benefit beyond our own generation to the next. There's my plug. The communion meditations like you heard from Eric this morning, labor given to get God's word right, to bring us before the cross of Jesus Christ week after week. The women's ministry is no different. The ladies in this church labor tirelessly to cut it straight, to get the word of God right. Listen, they have a fear of getting it wrong. That's a good thing. For those of you uh, ladies who will participate in the Titus study beginning in January, I got to see the, the workbooks being printed off this week in the office and it's grammatical line diagrams for the whole book of Titus because these ladies want to get it right. A wellspring and build and the trust and small groups and the expositor seminary, all these various layers of ministry in the church are built on hermeneutics. That is, they're built on the word of God rightly understood. It's critical. The doctrinal statement of Grace Bible Church is built on the word of God rightly understood, systematically uh, understood in its various topics that it touches on. The, the lyrics of the songs that we sing are combed over in detail. And listen, if there are some, they're hermeneutically aberrant. Josh rewrites them. Did you know that? Have you heard songs on the radio and come in here and go, hey, where's verse two? It's hermeneutics. We want to get it right. We want to sing it right. We're teaching one another songs, hymns, and spiritual songs on Sunday mornings. We're handling God's word. Maybe hermeneutics is a new word to you this morning. Uh, maybe you're, you're not even going to attempt to pronounce it at lunch. It's all right. You already use it every day. Did you know that you've been a student of hermeneutics your whole life? Every time you speak, every time you listen, every time you read or write, you are using hermeneutics. In all of our communications, we are communicating in order to be understood, and we're interpreting what we hear. This is the nature of language. And whether you know it or not, you've been studying hermeneutics your whole life. And even though our culture is presently in the process of deconstructing language, trying to make all of life meaningless by making words meaningless. They're trying really hard, but they actually can't do it, right? Try to apply postmodern linguistics to your IRS tax form, and you will go to jail. 
right? Everybody knows what words mean, and you're playing games if you pretend otherwise. By the way, the next time somebody says, oh, words don't mean anything, they're just signs and symbols for meaning which is embedded in some mysterious way you can never really get to unless you talk to me, the expert about linguistics. Next time you talk to that guy, you say, wow, I love what you're saying. You're saying that language is clear because it was created by a Trinitarian relational God who wanted to be understood, and he's able to communicate. Thank you. He says, no, that's not what I meant at all. Well, it's what it meant to me, which is the very thing you're trying to prove. (laughs) The deconstruction of language doesn't actually work because you have to use words to say it, and they expect us to understand them. You see, the nature of language is rooted in God. It transcends time. It it transcends humanity. It transcends our universe. It's, It's rooted in a God who is Trinitarian, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and who is relational, who interacts, who communicates. In fact, the second person of the Trinity is called the Word. And language is not just rooted in God, it is embedded in humanity. Think about the very first conversations between humans, Adam and Eve in the garden, communicating with God, communicating with a snake, and communicating with each other, day one of their lives. I don't know if you remember day one in the conversations you had, but the conversations they had on day one of their existence were understood. In fact, God communicated with Adam and Eve gave them instructions that he expected them to obey. You understand there were consequences for their not obeying what God said. And for them to obey it, they had to understand it. The idea of understanding language was just embedded in humanity from the very beginning. It's how God created us. Communicative, receptors of communication. And our hermeneutics is not just based in the nature of God, the nature of language, but also in the nature of our Bible, our bibliology. Titus 1-2 says, God cannot lie. And the things that God wrote are in keeping with his very character and his very nature. The Bible cannot lie. The Bible cannot be errant. The Bible does not err. It speaks accurately about every single thing that it says. And the Bible is also clear. The Bible teaches us about its own clarity. And and, and this is the very thing upon which commands are predicated. God speaks. His people are to listen. They are to obey him. There are blessings and cursings for obediences and disobediences. God did not have a speech impediment. God knows how to use language. And we have the responsibility to listen, to understand, and obey. And you can read things in your Bible like this. Have you not read? O you who are slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Listen, the Pharisees didn't dislike Jesus because his hermeneutics were bad. No, he he clearly understood the Old Testament, and they clearly understood the Old Testament. Now, there are complications to the clarity of Scripture. You're thinking about them right now. You're thinking, well, I don't understand every verse in my Bible. (laughs) Let's talk about some of those complications. There are significant complications for those who do not have the Bible in their own language. For the Germans before Luther, for the English before Wycliffe, for the many peoples in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. For people groups and language groups all over the world that still don't have God's word in their language, there's a significant barrier to the clarity of Scripture. (laughs) There are other barriers. You know, I I confess that I don't understand every passage accurately. I, I can't tell you what it's like to think about preaching, handle the truth accurately, and making sure you're handling this verse accurately. (laughs) You want to get it right. And I know I don't understand every passage in my Bible. And I don't think any exegete ever will understand every passage in the Bible completely accurately. This is a lifelong process in a rich book that's beyond us to accomplish in our lifetimes. It's still what we aim at. 
How is the word of God, which is intrinsically clear, obscured to the individual reader? Number one, if it's not in your language. Number two, if you don't read it. Let's talk about some other categories of obscuring what is clear. Unbelief. Unbelief obscures the clarity of Scripture for the individual unbeliever. We talked about that last week, 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're spiritual things. He's a natural thing. He doesn't get it. Right? The writer to Hebrews talks about the Jews having the veil over their eyes, so they read the Bible and they don't really get what's going on. There is meaning in Scripture inaccessible to someone who does not have the Holy Spirit in him. And I'm not talking about uh, the Holy Spirit in your hermeneutical process somehow revealing and guiding you to truth. I mean, unless you're born again, the blinders are still on and you cannot understand the meaning of God's word. You can diagram sentences and miss everything. There are other complications um, not just categorical unbelief, but also situational unbelief. If there's something resisting God in my heart, listen, the word of God will be more obscure to me. Clarity in your reading of your Bible comes with a clear conscience. This is why the false teaching in the New Testament is always joined with either outward sins or hidden sins, a, a fouled conscience obscures texts. Listen, you run away from the things that poke at your sin. If you're not on a short account with God, you're going to miss things in God's word. A clean conscience and clarity go together. There's also satanic blinding. The, the God of this world blinds the minds of unbelievers so that they do not see the gospel. Listen, you can read about the gospel. If you're an unbeliever, you can pick up your Bible and find out that Jesus died for sins, and if you repent and believe in him, you can have eternal life. And you can be blinded by Satan to read it and not see it. Of course, there is judicial blinding. And for those unbelievers who said, listen, I don't want to hear from God. God said, okay. Um, you want to not hear from me, I'll give you deafness. You want to not see me, I'll make you blind. Jesus said in, in Matthew 13, after speaking publicly and clearly in the first 12 chapters of Matthew, Matthew 13 is a turning point where he begins to speak publicly in parables and he teaches clearly in private to the disciples. Why? Because they didn't want to understand. God actually judged them and gave them over to more obscuring of his truth. Teach them in parables, not going to explain them to you. It's a judgment. It's not unsimilar to Romans 1. God gave them over to further sin and further failures of understanding. Of course, we can be deceived by false teachers. You know that we're still accountable for a right understanding of God's word, even if we become subject to false teaching. <laughs> Everyone stands on their own before the Lord with what you do with God's word. Of course, there are non homardiological complications to my Bible reading, things that don't have to do with sin and judgment. <laughs> Number one, I'm finite. Um, you're not sinning if on the first day you became a Christian, you only got through 27 books of your Bible <laughs> and you didn't know the rest. There, there's a progress to be had in reading and understanding our Bible that's not sinful. And I don't understand everything yet. And of course, uh, limited access um, for many in church history has kept people from understanding things that God intended to be clear. I think in our day, with as many copies of God's word in our language that we have access to, with as many teachers, with as many resources... Um, it, it's a shame to be biblically illiterate. It's a shame to not know what God means by what he says. And I fear we often aren't workmen <laughs> seeking to present ourselves before God approved. The problem is not with God's ability to communicate, but with us as communication receptors. You may have heard the protest, well, wasn't the Bible written by men? Aren't men fallible? I'll just leave you with 2 Peter 
can write that down. How did God ensure that what men wrote in the scripture was absolutely error-free, his word? They were born along by the Holy Spirit in his process of writing the scriptures. There are a lot of ways to approach the Bible differently than what we talked about. We talked about understanding words in their context in the original setting. That's it for hermeneutics. There are a lot of other approaches to hermeneutics. A typological, allegorical, anagogical, mystical, redemptive, historical, canonical, the hermeneutic of humility, Christocentric, Christotelic, trajectory, historical, retrieval, retrogressive, theological, and on and on and on. It seems like every expert in hermeneutics comes up with some new label by which you got to use his system and his rules to get to the text. I'm just going to tell you there's really only two. You let the word of God speak or something outside of the text of scripture is going to tell you how to interpret it. The self-display of Scripture is the best key to understanding Scripture. You don't get to those other hermeneutical methods if you were just reading your Bible. Some expert has to tell you, don't believe what it says, believe what I'm telling you it says based on my set of rules. Move away from the plain meaning of a passage to understand through the normal use of language. And any time we have to go outside of Scripture to interpret Scripture, we, we get in trouble. And maybe you're thinking, but wait, aren't the rules of hermeneutics outside of Scripture? Aren't we imposing them on the Bible? Aren't the rules of hermeneutics that you're suggesting, the, the words in their context with the historical under the setting, aren't those the product of the Enlightenment and humanism and a reductionistic, atomistic modernism imposed onto the text? The reality is the self-attesting nature of the Bible works according to language, which God invented, which is universal human phenomenon. And we just read our Bible, understand our Bible according to the ways that language works. There are lots of ways to get it wrong, and we have to work hard to get it right. Let's think back to these six characteristics. As we handle God's word, we want to be earnest, accountable, proven, industrious, unashamed, and accurate. It means we actually become afraid to misrepresent God while we engage in the joy of discovery of God, promoting right living. This is where we get real help for each other, the recalibration of our thoughts and attitudes and desires. This is fuel for our worship. And best of all, this is where we get to know him. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Let us not take it for granted. Let us not be lazy with your word, but let us treat it as the treasure that it is. God, give us humility to sit before you, to tremble at your word, to long to know you in it, and to accurately handle it for your glory, for the benefit of your church, for love for one another. In Jesus' name.